As we shout your praise from our hearts to your ears, you said, All the glory is yours, not forevermore. Here on worship, all we can give is for you. Say, We're for you. Yeah. For you. For you. Yeah, we're here for you. Here we go, church, come on. Sing, we dance. We sing. sing a song like when the ark comes back to the city when the presence of God shows up everything changes church and I'm seeing a few eyes look like what's happening and I'm telling you right now God is here and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom where the spirit of the Lord is is the fullness of joy where the spirit of the Lord is there is healing and I am here to tell somebody God is moving in a mighty way today that he has never done before I feel like you know, last service, I, I had to share this. We're going to get ready to go into a song called Perfect Strength right now where it's all about God's strength being perfect in our life. 
and Pastor Ron began to do an altar call about releasing certain things that have been holding us back, forgiving and releasing the resentment, the anger, the things that are in our hearts. And I came down and I had to let some things go. And I felt like as God was bringing some things up that I needed to deal with, he took me back to when I was a little boy. And he, he showed me a scene of, of a traumatic event that I was dealing with and I went through and if certain things were in place, I would have never had to deal with it, but it wasn't. God got me through it, but I felt like God showed me. He said, you were there, you went through this thing, and as a result of it, you've had this anger, you've had this resentment, you've had this thing in your heart that is preventing you from experiencing the fullness of me. And the reason why is because you have not forgiven to know that I have always been there. What forgiveness does is it reveals the fact that the thing that I was going through that I need to forgive, God was with me in. So the time that I dealt with the traumatic event where that person did what he did, God was saying, son, I was there. I am the reason you are standing right now before people praising my name, declaring my goodness. When you've had every reason to have hate, anger, resentment, you should have never gone through what you did. But when you were at your weakest point, I was there and I was strong. When you were at your lowest point, I was there and I brought you up. When David cried out in the wilderness and you didn't know and we read and he was like, why is he praising? Why is he doing? God was there and I'm here to tell somebody right now that that spirit of healing and that spirit of releasing is in this room right now and I feel God saying I was there so you can forgive them I was there so you can let it go you are breathing right now you overcame the thing that tried to take you out because I was there in your weakness my strength has been made perfect. Is this speaking to anybody in this room right now? Specifically, I'm even hearing men of God right now beginning to release things. Releasing the anger, releasing the resentment, re releasing the weakness that is preventing you from being the man of God, the priest, the prophet of your house, to say God is good. He is worthy of my praise. Is anybody hearing that today, church? So Father, right now, as we begin this song, Lord, we put our faith and our trust in you. And we thank you that in our weakness, God, your strength has been made perfect. So we speak to the broken places. We give you the honor. We give you the glory. Right now, in Jesus' name, we say, The times I've been, you have been strong. I found there's nothing like the strength of the Lord. Help me let go when I tried to hold on to everything in my life that didn't belong. So right here, I boldly declare, we can say, so what is heavy? You can lift it, burdens I carry, you make them lie. And in Defend me in every battle. I know you will fight. And if you know it, come on, boldly declare your strength. He is perfect for me. You find me in times of need. Your strength he is perfect. So we say, so let me be so you can be strong. I found there's 
He has carried us. He's carrying us. He will carry us. We say, you carry us through. Oh, we're never alone. We never were alone. You carry us through. So with faith, we know. We can sing this out in confidence. We say, that you give me strength from day to day. I'm standing here, oh, by your grace, cause you never lose your power, you never lose your power, say, you, oh, from day to day, say, from day to day.
Are you glad you serve a God that just does not lose? I'm going to give a chance for some people to accept Jesus. Stand right there if you would. Two more minutes. Stand right there. Me and my wife have been on an exhausting schedule. About, about as rigorous as any I've ever had. <clears throat> and I had to speak at a conference and I was so unbelievably tired and different people respond to that different ways. A lot of people when they get tired, their body gets tired. When I get tired, I have a hard time focusing. My body, I can plow through it, but I have a hard time dialing in. If I'm studying stuff, just bouncing off my head, I have a hard time concentrating. That's, what, that's the way weariness affects me. And it was all I could do to try to prepare for that night and just try to get my notes in order because I was fighting just an unbelievably sleep deprivation and tiredness and hard schedule. And then I got up in the pulpit, grabbed the microphone, standing in front of the people and the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, I want you to switch messages and I want you to preach it out of memory. I'd done sent them the scriptures to put on the screens. I'd sat there drunk a, two pots of coffee that day with espresso, trying to get them notes in my head and get ready for that night. And I mean, I pick up the mic and just as clear as I'm talking to you, that's not it. I want you to preach this. God, I don't have any scriptures. Preach it from memory. Your strength is perfect in me and I got out of that room that night and I told Hope I said God tested me God tested me to see if I would rely on him to step up because the thought of, of any night not to try to pull from memory that was the night but God required that of me and can I just be honest with you I preached the paint off the walls I was quoting scripture verbatim. I mean, probably 30, 35 of them right at the back of my head, just boom. One, that thing lined up in my head. But I had to understand my strength is not in my rest. My strength is not in my night's sleep. My strength is not in my day off. I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Somebody needs to know you're strong in the Lord. Everything else you may be weak, but in your weakness, he is made strong. My God, I feel this thing. And so those of you that don't know Jesus, what am I offering you? When you have no peace, a God who is peace. When you have no strength, a God who is strength. When you have no love to give, a God who gives love to you. See, the world takes, but I'm offering you grace. Grace supplies. The world is a pipeline from you. Grace is a pipeline to you. And we talk about the grace of God where God says, I want to give you what you don't have. And I want to supply you with what you don't deserve. Because that's what grace does. He's healing in sickness. He's healing balm and pain. He's the healer of wounds. He's the breaker of bondages. What does he want from me, Pastor? Love him. Love him. That's what he wants. He don't want stuff, he wants you. Anybody heads, close your eyes just for a moment. Very simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but you would live forever. So God will bless you now and secure your eternity. That's the best I have to give. And guess what? It's free because Jesus paid for it. 
and all you have to do is believe in him and everything he paid for is yours. Would you ask Jesus into your heart at this moment with head bowed and eyes closed? If you would just simply be in this category, you say, Pastor, I just, I don't really know him. I didn't ask you if you've been to church. I didn't ask you, was your mama a Christian? I just want to ask you, I said, if you would say, you know, I, I, I don't really know him. I, don't, I just don't really know him. Or I'm not sure. Or you may be visiting in here today and it's the first time you've ever been in anything like this and you say, I, 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 I know I don't know him. But if there's any question in your heart about where you and God stand, this is for you. And for those of you fighting in your mind whether or not this is God talking to you, let me tell you how I know this is you. Because the Bible says no person can come to God unless God draw him. So the fact that you're feeling drawn in this moment is the proof that's God. So right now, if you say, Pastor, I don't know him. But if he's anything like what you just explained, I want to. If that's you right now, just raise your hand. Just lift your hand in this building. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Two hands went up. Three hands have gone up. Four hands have gone up. Four hands have gone up. I saw one in the balcony. Five, six, seven hands have gone up. Hallelujah. Seven people. Come on, is there anybody else? Eight people. Hallelujah have raised their hand. Let's give Jesus the loudest hand clap we have. Eight people about to be snatched out of darkness into light. What a great day. You ready? You still got some in you? Let's pray this prayer together. Thank you, Jesus, that you are God's power to save. So today, I open my heart. I ask you to come in to be my Lord and Savior. I put my faith in you. I believe you died and rose on the third day for me to purchase my salvation. I accept that gift now and forever. And I thank you that as of right now, I am absolutely, positively saved. Eight people just changed their life forever. Come on. While he's turning up the lights, can you just give God some praise for that? Hallelujah. Make everybody feel amazing. You got people all around you. Ready? Begin to shake all their hands, hug their necks, introduce yourself. Ready? Go. If you decided to follow Jesus, allow us to be the first to welcome you into the family of God. Let us take this journey of faith with you by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. Is it your first time here? You are our VIP guest. Get connected by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. Life is better with a family of believers. Don't do life alone. Now let's head back into service. Scripture in the Bible, it says, that the blessing of the Lord, let me paraphrase it, that the blessing of the Lord brings wealth. I get amazed and amused at the people that want to get on social media and bash me because I want people to be blessed. Isn't that crazy? I'm going to tell you right now, unabashedly and unashamedly, I believe God blesses people. And I believe God wants to bless everybody under the sound of my voice. And I believe God accepts you like you are, but he never keeps you like you are. Everything about God is increase. The first thing out of his mouth to Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply. The word of God is a seed. What does a seed do? Multiply. Bible said the kingdom is like a mustard seed that becomes the largest of all the plants. The kingdom is like a net that brings in all types of fish. Everything's increase, multiply, increase, multiply. Well, the Bible says that when God blesses you, it brings wealth. Listen, and the Bible says he adds no sorrow to it. People can increase and have great wealth outside of God. They can hate God, they can mock God, and some do. But what you don't see is their tears, their fear, their suicide, the depression, the illness, the loss of health, the crushing of the family. You don't see the price tag. But God said the wealth that I bring, you don't cry. 
The way to know that the Lord is blessing you is when there's no sorrow that comes with it. I've had blessings that come to my life and there was great pain that accompanied it. And I've also had blessings that come to my life and I didn't cry a tear. The blessing of the Lord maketh one rich and he addeth no sorrow to it. How is the blessing released? The Bible says in this moment, bring the tithe and the offering and said, I'll foul not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. What does this blessing do? It increases you without crying. It increases you without pain. It increases you without bringing sorrow with it. That's the kind of blessing I want in your life. I'm unabashed when it comes to the Word of God. You know why? Because when I speak the Word of God, I'm not the one that has to produce it. God does. All I got to do is speak it. And when I speak it, it's up to God to perform it. Because the Bible says He watches over His Word to per say perform, to perform it. So today, let it be done, O God, in their life. Increase. Our God is a good God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Bible says. Lord, we thank you that we are your children. We are your offspring and you desire to do good things for your children. We embrace that right now in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that if some of us have had gain, increase, wealth that have had a great price tag, I pray that right now we would experience that blessing that comes from the Lord that doesn't bring tears and doesn't bring pain. But it is a good gift. So Lord, we accept your word now and let it be done in our life on earth as it is in heaven. If you believe that with me, say amen. amen. That deserves a clap right there in Jesus' name, amen. Here's all the ways you can give. Praise team, let's do it again. More people have chosen to use text to give as their preferred way of giving because it is safe, quick, and very easy. Here's how it works. Open a new text message on your phone and use your text to give number. Text RCM to 864-920-1282. The very first time you use the service to give, you will receive a text message with a link to a registration form. Click the link in the text and it will direct you to enter your information. You will only have to enter your information once to set up the service. Then it's a matter of seconds to give. It's safe and secure, easy to use, and you will receive an instant receipt. Add your text to give number in your contact list so you'll have it ready. That's it. Giving has never been so easy. And we thank you for your generosity. to pursue what God's got for my life, a persecution will come again. Well, who do you think you are? Well, nobody in our family's ever, you need to quit trying to act like you ain't just one of us. Rejoice and be glad because there's a great and effective door awaiting me and there are many adversaries. You will outlive this devil, you will overcome this devil, and in the name of Jesus, you will open a door. Hey! In my book, The Necessity of the Enemy, I have a chapter. Uh, I'm putting a real twist on the way I'm going to preach on it. Uh, but it's called The Enemy Within. Um, we've been talking for not weeks now, months, about enemies announce doors. That your next challenge is announcing your next opportunity. Doors and enemies go together. And so whenever there's an opportunity, then there's usually something standing in front of it that's in the way. And God said, don't rejoice when you open the door. He said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad when you see the enemy, because the enemy is announcing the door. The Bible says, consider it pure joy when you go through diverse trials of all kinds. Don't that sound crazy? Consider it joy when you're going through a trial? Then he makes sense. But with God, you gotta understand what is foolishness to us is wisdom to Him. And uh, so challenges, opportunities, giants that have to be fought 
Usually a representative on the next side of that, there's something, there's a great door, a great opportunity that God can open. But the biggest challenges in life, if you're honest with yourself, are never going to be external. They're going to be internal. Internal. Uh, Bishop Jakes, who I've known for 24 years, uh, he has a saying, and I love it. I think it's, he says it better than anybody. He says, my enemy is in me. Because everybody's talking about something out here they want God to fix. But almost everything out here is a derivative of something that is in here. If you got chaos on, on around you, it's probably because you have chaos in you. I got no love for over there. I'm going over here. If you've got drama around you, it's because you have drama in you. If you have disorder around you, it's usually because there's disorder in you. And the reason I'm getting very few amens is because we are living in a generation that blames everybody for everything. And let me tell you something about blaming. As long as your problems are somebody else's fault, you're powerless to change them. I always own everything. That's on me. Why? Because if it's my responsibility, I got the power to change it. If it's your responsibility, then I just got to deal with it. The devil is a liar if I'm going to let everything be blamed on you and you hold the keys to my life. The greatest thing Jesus gives you is the power to change it yourself. <laughs> and so I tell people when they're a leader, I say everything's not your fault, but everything's your responsibility. Everything. So when somebody else, if I have somebody else in this staff, if they screw up, it might not have been my fault, but it's Ron Carpenter's responsibility. And that's the way I live. That would be a nice change for our generation in American culture today. If everybody would just say, you know what, I, I screwed that up. Why is that so hard to do? I screwed that. It ain't your fault at all. I screwed it up. So your biggest battle is overcoming the stuff inside. If you can win it in here, you can win it out here. Because getting this straightened out usually will straighten this out automatically. Okay? Well, I need God to fix my marriage. Well, let God fix your heart. And then you will see your marriage automatically getting better. Okay? You say, I need you to prove that to me. I'm glad you said that because I'm about to in these next few scriptures. Uh, very quickly, Matthew 5, 8, then I'm going to Matthew 15. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. It's not talking about go to heaven one day. All you got to do to go to heaven is be saved. But blessed are the pure in heart because those people will constantly see God at work in their life. If I want to see God at work in this church, I got to keep my heart right. I can't let a bunch of things pollute my life. Because if it pollutes my life, then I'll grab this microphone and I'll spew that poison over every one of you. Nothing worse than an old bitter preacher. Nothing worse. Oh, it's terrible. A preacher who's just been through a lot and he's got cynical and negative and bitter and gets a microphone and just preaches that mess to everybody. Had a person ask me one time, I was on a panel at a pastor's conference. I was serving on a panel of about four different pastors. I don't like panels, they're usually not good. They're usually boring, to be quite honest with you. And I don't do them much, and I don't agree to serve on them much, but this one I did, because the people I were with were very esteemed people. I said, well, maybe this one will be better. And I served on a panel, and one of the people got up and the question came to me. He said, how do you sustain, you know, 33 years of ministry? He said, and when you get up, you still act like you love Jesus and love people and love what you do. And this was a real question. And the guy was probably only half my age because the average tenure of a pastor now is seven years, six or seven years, and they get out forever, okay? And I looked at him, I said, that's an easy response. I said, that's a great question. And the easy response, I said, you have to keep your heart pure. I said, a lot of things happen to you by people that you care about. 
And I said, you got to learn how to deal with those things and get up every time with your microphone and you still love Jesus and you still love people and you still believe God can change somebody's life and you still are willing to be gracious and merciful. I said, that's the most difficult thing to sustain in longevity of ministry is to go through everything you're going to go through and keep your heart right. That's the challenge. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You keep your heart pure, you'll see God work in your finances. You keep your heart pure, God will work in your marriage and in your home. You keep your heart pure, you won't believe what God will do in your future and with your potential. There's something about a pure heart that is magnetic to God. God loves those people who do everything in their effort to walk up rightly, the Bible says. Matthew 15. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. So Jesus and his disciples have been traveling and they're hungry and they've actually begun to go through different fields and pick from the grain and then walk into people's houses and communities and people are feeding them bread. But the tradition of the Hebrews was you go through not just washing your hands, but a ceremony before you eat, and Jesus is not following that tradition. So all the religious people are confronting him. Why do you, and Jesus answered and said, why do you transgress the commandments of God because of your tradition? He says, you elevate your traditions above what the word of God is. Keep going, please. Next verse, let's go on. Yes, thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. He gives them an example of what he's talking about. And then he says, your traditions are more powerful than my word. He says, I can give you a word that can change your life, but you can hold true tradition. And it'll nullify it. Man, can you believe the only thing more powerful in the earth than the word of God is a tradition? Crazy. Go on to verse 10, I think it is. I believe it's verse 10 through 20. When he called the multitude to himself, he said, hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. Did you hear that? Every vegan and vegetarian, I love you, but I got Jesus on my side. I know you got science, but I got Jesus. I'm messing with y'all. <laughs> then his disciples said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when what they heard you say? He said, every plant which, is, which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, will they not both fall into a ditch? Then Peter said, explain to us what you're saying. So Jesus, are you also are still without understanding? He said, do you not understand that whatever enters a man's mouth goes into his stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Ah, oh, here we go. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. He said, it ain't the stuff you're putting in you that's messing you up, but the stuff that's coming out of you that's messing your life up. He said, because it comes from the heart. Those things come out of the mouth and they defile a man. Next verse. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, fault witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with your hands not washed, he said, that don't defile you. So Father, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, say, here we go, neighbor. Here we go, here we go. Go ahead and throw um, Proverbs 4 and verse 20 up there. I'll be there in about 60 seconds. I'm laying a foundation that I want to give you a story to illustrate what I'm saying today. So what enemy are we trying to talk about, focus on, and conquer today? The stuff in us. Most of the time, what's holding you back is not what's around you. It's something in you. Uh, it's, it's, it, there, there's somebody not too long ago, me and my wife were talking about, and magnificently gifted. When I say gifted, 
supernaturally gifted. They have things in them that are just not common, okay? And then I looked at, I looked at Hope because they're elevated in age, but their, their track record had not shown the fruitfulness. And I said, I wonder why this particular person being so mightily gifted has, has not seen more accomplishment in their life. And then I got a chance to experience three or four things and I came back and said, oh, now I see why. Didn't have nothing to do with gifts, had to do with heart issues. Heart issues. Things that you go two step forwards and they snap you right back. Things in you that cause you to mash your own sabotage button. You sabotage your own success. See, I've often talked to you about a ship, a boat can go through a storm as long as the water doesn't get in the boat. You've heard me say that before. Jesus talked about houses that were blown down when the storms came and the houses that stood. As long as the storm doesn't get in the house, the house is fine. As long as the water doesn't get in the boat, the boat's fine. As long as you walk through things, you're fine. But when the thing you're walking through, you stop and it starts to get in you. Then something that was supposed to be a season begins to be a life. So will you walk through the divorce? or will the divorce rule you for the rest of your life? Will you walk through what your partner in the company did or will that rule you with resentment and anger and sabotage all of your creativity for the rest of your life? There are things that God wanted you to walk through in a season. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there are times I walk through shadowy places. There are times I walk through dark places. There are times I walk through things that look like they're going to kill me. But the thing is, keep on walking. He said, walk through it. Don't stop and build a house in it. And there are things in life that are painful. There are things in life that are traumatic. There are things in life that are unfortunate. There are things that we are dealt blows by the hands of other people. There are people we believed in that let us down. There are people that deceived us. There are people that they're not what we thought they were. They hid things from us. They lied to us. They betrayed us. They sued us. The list goes on and on and on. And you're all right if you can process it and keep moving. But when you stop and let all of those toxins get in your heart, then all of a sudden you begin to create issues for yourself long after they have left your life. My, I mean, my claps have fallen off a cliff in the last three or four minutes here. Okay? Keep rolling with me. I'm going somewhere with this. Proverbs 4, verse 20. This is Solomon who speaks as a father and he's speaking to who he calls the son, okay? He said, my son, give your attention to my words. I love the book of Proverbs. It's the wisdom of God. Incline your ear to my saying. He's saying, don't blow me off because you know everything, okay? Man, when I was a teenager, my parents were idiots. <laughs> By the time I got in college and I was a young adult, I'm like, well, they know some things. By the time I got in my 30s, I'm like, you know what? My mom and dad had something to say. <laughs> By the time I got about 40 years old, I thought they were Solomon. <laughs> He's trying to talk to a youth and said, I know you think you know more, but I would ask you to listen to me. Look what he says. Keep my words, do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Look at what he says they'll do for they are life to those who find them and health to all flesh. He said, I'm about to tell you something that will increase the quality of your life and heal your diseased body. I'm getting ready to tell you things that will keep sickness out of your house. This is powerful. Now look what he says. It's amazing where he goes. Next verse. Keep your heart. Listen to me, son. What I'm telling you will give you life. What I'm telling you will heal your body. This is how powerful it is. Guard your heart. Why? Your heart affects all of it. If it gets in your heart, it affects your health. I'm not talking about the blood pump. I'm talking about the inner man. 
If you let this get inside of you and you let this take up residence and instead of you walking through it, you carry it. It'll make you sick. It'll destroy the quality of your life and it will follow you all the days of your life. He said, so the number one thing I can tell you is take your heart and guard it. Okay? With all diligence. What does diligence look like? For out of it springs the issues of life. Stay right there with that verse. I got to talk about this. For out of it springs the issues of life. Pastor, I got this going on in my life. There's so much drama in my house and I just need you to pray and lay hands on me and ask God to break that. The devil didn't cause that. Your heart did. Okay, you're not giving me any love now. Folk in the middle, you are my last hope for love. I know I got a few from balcony too. All right, I'm gonna keep going. I'll find somebody who wants to hear it now. The devil does not create your issues. Your heart does. I can't date her no more, boy. She got issues. I bet you got a few too. Where do they come from? Out of the heart flow the issues of life. Your heart is your garden. Your heart is the, is the soil for seed. What does soil do? I know this is not an agricultural part of California, but what does soil do? When seed is dropped in soil, seed does nothing. Put it on a shelf, it's seed. Put it on a counter, it's seed. Throw it on the asphalt, it's seed. Throw it in soil, ooh. Because the soil has the ability to take the life inside the seed and push it to the surface. So your heart, whatever you let get in you, has the ability to take it and push the life of it to the surface and it becomes your issue. For out of the heart flow the issues of life. So your issues have been created by what got in you. Oh, you liked it better when you could blame it on the devil, didn't you? I took that away from you, I'm sorry. So you guard your heart, how do you do that? Next verse. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. So now he's telling me the diligent way to guard your heart. Your heart is your city. Okay, you don't guard a city at the city. If the armed troops get to the city, the battle's over. So you got to guard them at the gate. And in Hebrew times, every city had a gate. And the gates were fortified, not the city. The city is too late. So they would fortify the gate. So he says, one of the gates to your heart is your mouth. Watch what you communicate. He said, because what you speak to lives and what you don't talk to dies. Some of you need to quit talking about your past because you are the one that keeps resurrecting it. Your words are keeping it alive. Shut your mouth about your past and get an imagination about your future that is so powerful that it'll snatch you out of the doldrums of your pain. Quit talking about it. And we talk about what they did and we talk about what they did and we talk about and we're keeping it alive because the power of life and death is in the tongue. If you communicate with it, it lives. If you quit talking to it, it dies. You talk to your wife, your marriage lives. Quit talking to her, it dies. It's true in everything. Your old high school friends, you keep communication with them, the relationship lives. You quit talking to them, it dies. It's the way it works. So he says, watch what you say. That's how you guard your heart. He said, and put perverse lips far from you. He said, people, who everything that comes out of their mouth and goes in your ear is toxic, poisonous, negative, cynical, half crazy. 
He said, distance yourself because your ears are not trash cans. It is amazing how we'll sit there and let people dump everything in our ears. He says, guard your heart by watching who you let have your ear. Some of you need to watch what people you listen to on YouTube. Some of you need to watch what you... Whoever has your ear has your future. Okay. Put away from your deceitful mouth. Put perverse lips far from you. Next verse. Let your eyes look straight ahead. So the way I guard my heart, my city has three gates. Has a mouth gate, has an ear gate, has an eye gate. We got to pay attention to what we're looking at. Just got to pay attention. Well, pastor, I need you. I just, I don't know. I can't sleep and I just, I'm afraid and I got anxiety and I just need God to. So I'm not diminishing the power at the altar, but I want us to see the inconsistency. What have you been doing? Well, I rented this movie on Netflix and it said blood, gore, and extreme horror. Now, I'm supposedly in a very smart portion of America. <laughs> there might be a reason you can't sleep. Because of what you watched three hours before you went to bed. I have people come to me, I want you to see this video. Did you hear what they said? I don't want to see that video. Yeah, but you need it. I don't want to see that video. I don't want you to put something in my heart that's got to make me forgive them. Well, did you hear their last speech? I don't want you to show me anything about that politician that makes me not want to pray for them because my Bible commands me to pray for those in authority. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. And I don't want to talk about it. Why? It ain't got so much to do with them as it's got to do with me. I'm guarding my heart. Are you with me so far? The pure in heart shall see God. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues of life. It's not what goes in a man that defiles him, but what comes out because it comes from the heart. Okay, are we all on the same page so far? <clears throat> I started dating Hope in the fall <clears throat> of 1987. And a lot of you that have never spent personal time with me, um, I don't love wide, but I love deep. So in my friend circle, it's not big. But if you're in that circle, they probably ain't nothing I won't give you and nothing I won't do. It's just the way I'm built, okay? Some people love a crowd and love shallow. I, that's not really me. Give me four or five people that I really care about and really care about me and I'll, go, I'll do anything for you. I love hard. Um, I only wanted to give my heart away one time. That was my plan. And uh, hope scared me. No girl had ever scared me. Um, I, I dated a lot. I was fine with girls. I was not shy by any means. But when I met her, she scared me. Let me tell you why she scared me. She scared me and I was not an extremely spiritual person. So it wasn't that. I'd only been saved about three months, so I wasn't exactly sanctified and full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <clears throat> but I knew, <clears throat> excuse me, I knew if I started dating her, she'd be the last girl I ever dated. I don't, I don't know how I knew that. I just knew that one's different. That's all I knew. And if you start dating her, this is the end of the road, bud. <laughs> it stops with this one right here. I just knew that. So I dodged her for a little while, and you know the stories about chasing, she, but she would, I was, because I was scared of that. That thought scared me, because I was, was 19, you know, how old was I, 19, 20 years old, 19? Now at 19 years old, that was a pretty lofty thought, that this, this, this right here, if I start dating her, she'll be the last girl I ever date. So, but finally I gave my heart away. And what I gave hope, I don't have two of them. I, I mean, she got it all, okay? She got, she got all of me when I gave her that. And I'm not saying that because our anniversary is about to come up. It's... <laughs> hey, thank you, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. So we have been dating about a year. Now the problem is I'm living in a boy's dorm and I hear the way all the other boys talk about this girl named Hope. Now, y'all know the pastor Ron. Y'all don't know redneck Ron. Okay. And so I knew even though I wanted to finish school before I even thought about getting married because I'd seen people get married while in college and they did not look like they were having fun. I wanted to finish school and I was only a sophomore, but I needed to somehow get this thing locked up. So I put a ring on it. Okay. So after we've been dating a little over a year, uh, I, I proposed to her and uh, offered, offered her a ring. And then after that, we just waited till I finished school. She was behind me. So I said, if I'm finished, we'll finish putting you through school. So, you know, I wasn't sure. Um, we're still learning each other, but I know I'm madly in love with her. I know I'm crazy about her. And I know I want her to be my wife. But you got to understand, I come, from perform I come from a family that if you didn't work in the field from morning till sunset, they had no use for you because all they valued was work and performance. You live in a corporate culture, most of you, where all they value is work and performance. And if you think they love you, then fail to perform. They'll show you how much they love you by hiring your replacement. So we live in a performance-oriented world. I came from a holiness church which that holiness church kind of even taught you to perform for God. You know, I had to do stuff to keep God liking me. Otherwise, he may wake up Thursday and not like me no more. Now, they didn't say that, but they said it without saying it. So everything in my life up to age 19, if you didn't perform well, you didn't sustain the relationship. So I didn't really know what unconditional love was, okay? Had a wonderful home, wonderful mom, wonderful dad, but they were the leaders of this holiness church and we, we just had rules all the time. And you got to keep those rules to stay in good standing with God. Okay? So now listen. I'm thinking I'm going to have to do something to blow this girl away. And I want her to say yes. I don't want her to turn me down. I'm very poor. Don't have any money. I'm working three jobs to try to get myself through college and I'm borrowing my way through while I'm working those three jobs. I went there, remember, on a basketball scholarship, but after I accepted the call to preach, I gave it up. So I had to work my way through. So I didn't spend a lot of money. In the summertime, stay with me, we were a poor family, so we didn't have vacation money, but my uncles who were farmers were all wealthy. And they had big old giant places on, on, the, on a lake in North Carolina. I mean, boats and wave runners and jet skis and cruisers and everything. I mean, they just, that's where they did their living. They had all these big places at the lake and they went there on weekends. And so my family vacation was to go to their home, lake house. So we would take it and have free vacation every year. Come on, somebody. Amen. We'd have free vacation living in a family place. And they let us use all their stuff, and they were good to us about it. So I knew we were coming up that summer. Me and Hope had been dating about a year. I knew I wanted to get engaged, and so I'm thinking, I'm putting together in my mind, because I'm visionary, I'm thinking, you know, if I invite her on this trip with my family, and, uh, and my mom and dad just love her and think she hung the moon, and I get out there at the lake, and, you know, a, a good meal, and I'm dressed real nice, and we go out on a boat ride, and I take her to this island, and sunset, and roses, and rings. So I already got women clapping in here. <laughs> Men, I'm messing you up, because you took her to McDonald's and said, what do you think? I'm putting all this stuff together in my mind. Why? Because I want to give her a night that she'll sit down and tell our grandkids about. Let me tell you about when your grandpa uh, proposed to me. I mean, I, I had it in my mind. I could see it. I could see what I wanted to do. And I had just about saved up enough money for the last 10 years of my life to pull this night off. And so anyway, I get my family in on it. I tell them what I want to do. And I tell Hope, I say, I got this place. I want to take you tonight, get dressed up. And uh, we're going to go. It's about 20 minutes from the lake. And we're just going to have a date night tonight. Well, you know, she loved that. And I mean, Hope can smile where all you can see is gums. I mean, I mean, just gums everywhere. So I could tell her I'm taking her out. And this big old smile come across her face. So I go out there and I plant it and I said to get my dad, I said, pick me up a dozen roses. Here's the money. That was $48 at the time. I remember it well. It's imprinted in my brain. 
And I said, I want you to take the ring and slide it on the stem of the roses. Take the roses, put a red bow around them in a white box, put them in the side of the boat. I called my uncle and asked him if I could use his cruiser. He let me use his cruiser boat by himself. Why he did that, I do not know. And uh, I had everything set up and there was this island about five miles out from where they lived and nobody was on the island. Beautiful green palm trees. I said, nah, sunset, island, boat, steak, lobster, roses. I got this thing in the bag. <laughs> so I go buy me a new outfit. That was a lot of money that I didn't have. You had used to have to know how poor it was, so me to go buy this whole outfit just for one night. That was a big deal. So I come out there, and I'm, I'm going out to my father's car, and I got this new outfit on, she comes out, so I don't know if she's already thinking. I've asked her several times, when did you know something was up? And she won't really tell me, but I, I came out there in a new outfit, and I'm taking her to a place, you know, about the best she ever got out of me was a double at Wendy's. And I'm taking her to this restaurant where they'll shine your shoes while you eat lobster. You know, on a, on a college guy's budget, okay? So we go out to this restaurant and while we get in the car to head to the restaurant, I look up and I notice clouds. Now, for those of you who have never been in an East Coast storm, I, I see the way y'all talk about rain. This out here ain't rain. It drizzles a little bit and y'all done parked on the side of the road and praying. <laughs> I'm talking about storms that pull houses off their foundation and pull the roots of trees out of the ground. I'm talking about rain where you can't see four inches in front of your windshield. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. So I go outside and I know this cloud, but roses, outfit, reservations, I'm committed. So we start heading to the restaurant and by then it's, it's drizzling pretty good, kind of like California rain. So it's doing a California style rain, but we go on in there and we have this magnificent meal, this time together. I can tell she's blown away. I've never spent that kind of money on her, never took her anywhere like that. And she's looking beautiful and I'm sitting there swagged out in my new outfit, hallelujah. What a swag, I got a little bit of swag, didn't I? Drip, swag, whatever you want to call it, I had something. So I'm sitting there in my new outfit and she's there and, and we're enjoying that meal. We've never had a meal like that together. And then we turn around and we get out of that and we're headed back home. By that time, it's a steady rain, okay? We have about a 20 minute ride. By the time I got back to the lake house, it's raining, okay? So then by the time, now let me, for those of you who don't have context, this is 1980s. I know all of you now part your hair in the middle and wear it straight. But back then, a half a can of hairspray per day, and you could pull one hair and all of them would move. The whole head would move. So she come out there in her outfit, you know, she's got mascara out to her, I mean, she's got eyeshadow out to her ears. She's got her bleach blonde hair, big as cotton candy on top of her head. And we're going out. And, but I'm so deep into this thing, I don't have a plan B. So we get back, and I mean, it's a steady rain, and we run down to the little lake house. They had this boat, this beautiful boat, in a covered lake house. I had to lower it down into the water, and I cranked it up, and I backed it out, and she's looking at me like, what are you doing? Because let me give you something, electricity 101. Water and electricity. They are not a good mix, for those of you who don't know, because water conducts electricity very well. So this is now, I'm here. Yeah, y'all don't do that. I mean, electrical storm, lightning everywhere, all over that lake, but I'm already too deep. I don't have no more money. There is no plan B. I hammered that boat down and we're headed across that lake. The wind is blowing, the water's white capping, and that boat is boom, boom, 
boom, and she is under the windshield like this with horror on her face, and now she looks like Dracula because everything's running out of her face, and her hair was out to here, and that's like this. You can see the people on the shoreline at their houses like, who is that idiot driving across the lake in a lightning storm? So we're, we're coming up. I mean, God, you got to get, I mean, raining. She's scared. She's about crying. She don't know what I'm doing. Has he lost his mind? What are we doing? So I'm coming up to this island and I pull back off the engine. And we're coasting in, and this boat is very expensive, and it is not mine. <laughs> and it raises up in the front, and it goes, bam, just stops. So I pee in my pants, and I look over the side. <laughs> and I am lodged on the biggest stump that God has ever created and put on this earth. So I got on a new outfit and I looked down there and I'm like, well, they, they sure ain't nobody coming out here to help us. So I just jump into a squish mud up to my waist. Mud. I mean, I went from 200 pounds to 350 pounds with mud, caked all up, mud to my waist. So have you ever seen a slow, I'm trying to walk to the front of the boat in the mud. Have you ever seen the movies in slow motion? That's the way I'm walking. One leg at a time, I mean, pick it up, it weighs like 120 pounds a piece. And I'm walking and get a tore my new outfit all day. I mean, I'm the orange mud man. I get to the front, I'm under the boat. She's crying. <laughs> And I'm under the boat trying to get it off. And finally, I get that huge boat unlodged off that thing. And I back to the boat and I pull my 300 pound self up over and I flop into the floor and I just lay there. And by this time, defeat has begun to set in. So I get back in that boat and I head right back to the lake house. I'm orange, I'm muddy. She looks horrible. <laughs> She's crying, I'm upset, we're going back. Boom, boom, it's pouring down rain, lightning, thundering. We make it by the grace of God. Back, I put it in that boathouse, pull it up out of the water and I just get out. I ain't speaking. Women, you know how men are. I ain't saying nothing. I just get out, I'm pouting. Walk down the side of the boathouse, sit on the edge of the pier, it's covered, and I'm looking at this torrential rain, and there's a cane pole there with a floater on it, and I take a worm, put it on the pole, put it in the water, and I sit there, looking straight ahead, pouring that rain, and I'm orange. She comes walking down and sits down beside me at the edge of the pier. And I still don't say nothing. I'm just sitting there looking straight ahead. After about 60 awkward seconds, I turn my head toward her and I say, would you marry me? Give me an A for effort. I learned, a, uh, I learned a valuable lesson. I know what time it is. Give me just a moment. That taught me a lot. Because I thought the way that night turned out, we probably 50-50 at best, maybe dropped to 40-60. And her eyes lit up and she screamed yes and she hugged the mud man. 
and she didn't let me go. And I'm sitting there saying, wow. That was the worst engagement performance in the history <laughs> of mankind. That was pitiful and pathetic. And I'm broke. <laughs> I have nothing to offer this woman. <laughs> nothing. And she said yes. She said yes. <clears throat> Because when it comes to love and the purity of the heart, performance has no part in real love. Real love does not change between great and poor performances. God doesn't love you better tomorrow if you get it all right than he did today if you screwed it all up. It's consistent and it doesn't change. And I didn't know what to do with it because I had always performed my way into anything. You want to play, perform. You want to get the scholarship, perform. You want to be the starting tight end, perform. You want to get A's in school, perform. You want to get promoted, perform. You want to stay this person's friend, perform. And then I met one that performance didn't matter. And it threw me. And the challenge to win the battle within is for you to keep your heart pure and maintain your ability to love despite people's poor, negative, vengeful, spiteful, deceitful performances in your life. That is your challenge. Is can you go through all that? And if you haven't experienced any of it, it's because you're 12. Because you just keep on living. And to walk out of it, and can you love again? And can I have people that I've invested in walk off and leave me and take a hundred people, hundred people out of church room? When, when you didn't have to become a thief, I would have gave you anything. And can you still keep your heart pure? And can you go through the failures of those that are around you and those that you love and kill, still keep your heart pure? That's the challenge of life. You know why? Because if it ever gets in you, ooh, you got issues. You got issues. Would you get this for me? Thank you. I'm going to do something. I know what time it is and I know what God's about to do because he did it in the last service. And I said, God, increase on it and do it again. Here's what I'm asking. There's some of you that can't believe why you have the things going on around you that you have because you see yourself as basically a good person and by most matters, you try to do right. But I need to go raw right here. Did you go through the divorce or did the divorce get in you? Did you go through the lawsuit or did the lawsuit get in you? Did you go through your partner stealing your commission or did that get in you? And now you're affecting everybody. You can't work with anybody because that has so affected you. They broke the partnership and walked off with half your clients and it got in you. And now nobody wants to be around you because you're so negative and you're so cynical and you live that way and that's affecting your wife and that's affecting your kids and you can't even get them to come see you. Why? Because something that happened got in your heart and now you have all these issues. The molestation. Is it something you've let go of or did it get in you? You say, well, he abused me or she abused me or they abused me. Okay, that is so unfortunate and it breaks my heart. But you know what? Is it going to stay in you? Are you going to, are you going to let that thing create the issues that your next husband will deal with and your kids will deal with and everybody that works you deal with because of something that happened when you were 11 and now you're 55? 
because out of the heart flow that Jesus said the stuff bad in your life ain't coming in you he said it's coming out of you so that means somehow it got in you and instead of going through the storm you're a storm carrier so now everywhere you get put becomes a storm because you carry it you didn't walk through it you embodied it I'm not minimizing its effect. I'm not minimizing its hurt. I'm certainly not downplaying your trauma, but I'm saying the condition of your heart will never be up to anybody else. It'll be up to you. The devil is a lie. I'm gonna wait on you 30 years to come back and apologize. Think I'm gonna sit here and sabotage my life with all the issues you caused me because I'm waiting on you to say I'm sorry. They may never come back and say they're sorry. You flush your heart whether they ever come back and apologize or not. They don't rule your life, you rule your life. And it's somber in here right now and I knew it would be because we've been talking about doors and opportunities and killing Goliath and slaying the giant. And and now I'm getting into this, ooh. But the hardest one ain't gonna be out here to win. The hardest one to win is out here. But if you're honest with yourself, you know it's affecting you. And some of you, it's not affected you for a week or months, it's affected you for years and decades. Why do you think after David screwed up so bad, took another man's wife from him, had a child with that wife, and then put her husband on the front line of battle to ensure his murder, when he was called out for his issues. Read Psalm 51 before you go to bed. That's his prayer. Do you know what the first thing he says is? Create in me a clean heart. He says, God, if you'll fix this, all of this will automatically begin to correct itself. He said, I'm not asking you to fix them. I'm not asking you to fix it. I'm asking you to fix me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And I'm gonna do it standing right here on this floor in the late hour because sometimes when you want freedom bad enough, you don't care what time it is. I'm asking you to drop your status. I'm asking you to drop your net worth. I'm asking you to drop any title or accomplishment you have. Something hurts you and it's still in there. And it's creating issues for you and people that care about you even to this day. And God today wants to take that pain out of your heart and you walk out of here a different person. Not while I'm on the stage, but while I'm right here on this floor, if that's you, would you have the courage? Because if three or four do it, then 40 will do it, then maybe 140 will do it. Last service, it was half the church. If you know it got in you, roots of bit. You know what the Bible says about bitterness? It said, let no bitter root spring up from within you and defile many. You don't know it, but the thing that's in you is defiling the whole room. You got rejected when you were a child. Now you have a root of bitterness about rejection. Now you walk into a room and you know what your life says. You don't even open your mouth. Your life says, reject me, reject me, reject me, reject. You need a hug worse than anybody in the room, but nobody can give you one. Because what's in you is defiling everybody in the whole room. I've had people that I knew needed a hug so bad and I would go up to them and it was all I could do because something in them was defiling me. That's what, that's what this stuff does. And I'm asking you today to say, yeah, yeah, it's in there and it's affecting me. And I want God to heal me from it. If that's you, would you have the courage to get out and come down here and stand with me at this altar right now? Man, woman, boy, or girl, come down here and stand with me right now. Who are you? Come down here and stand. Come on, sir. Come on, ma'am. Come on, come stand with me right here at this altar. Come on and stand with me. Come on, man, bring your tears, bring everything, bring it down here. I need a lot of people down here with tissues, please. Just stand right around here, yeah, just anywhere. Come on. Wow. 
Wow. Some of you trying to hold it together, don't hold it together. This ain't a hold it together altar call. This is a let it go altar call. Quit worrying about your mascara and your eyelashes and your wrinkled in your shirt. Forget about it, man. This is a time we're going to get free. Sing it, Lizzie. I give you my soul. What an incredible service. Listen, we want to honor this moment. Pastor Ron gave some instructions. So listen, no matter where you are, let's stop. Let's go in. Let's talk to God. Let's be honest. Let's be transparent. Let's let him do our thing in our life. No matter what you're doing, you might be driving, pull over. Listen, if you're at work, shut your door. If you're at home, lift your hands. But right now, I want to challenge you to be honest with God. Get your heart right with God. He wants to do something special in your life today. Listen, we have an incredible team right now also of prayer warriors. If you want us to pray and agree with you, hit that prayer button. We have an awesome team ready to pray, ready to fight heaven for you, ready to believe with you. We love you guys. We are praying and believing for the best week ever. Thank you so much for being connected. We can't wait to see you next week. Thank you.